Okay, welcome as you're all entering our Zoom room for the fifth part of our series, Antisemitism Since the Holocaust. Let me welcome you also on behalf of my co-conveners for this series, Professor Pamela Nadell and Professor Lauren Strauss. Uh, the topic of today's conversation is the Holocaust, antisemitism, and the memory of the Jewish past in the Arab world. And now it is my pleasure to briefly introduce the moderator of this session, uh, my dear colleague in the history department and a professor in the School of International Service here at American University, Professor Elizabeth Thompson, who is the Mohammed S. Farsi Chair of Islamic Peace here at AU. She's a historian of social movements and liberal constitutionalism in the Middle East, and she has a special focus on race and gender and how those have conditioned foreign intervention and the application of international law. Her recently published third book, uh, How the West Stole Democracy from the Arabs, the Syrian Arab Congress and the Destruction of its Historic Liberal Islamic Alliance, was published this year and is already widely reviewed. She's also author of two previous books on constitutional government in the Middle East and on republican rights, paternal privilege, and gender in French, Syria, and Lebanon, which both won national prizes. Um, right now, she is working, uh, among many other projects, on a book on Egypt in the 1940s, uh, especially through movies. And I think that's also an important topic for um, our discussion because many people involved were Eg Egyptian Jews, I believe, and also many of these movies are very popular among Israeli audiences later. So without much further ado, uh, let me welcome um, the wonderful, uh, this wonderful panel and uh, the really diverse uh, uh, um, panelists and, and I pass uh, the floor, is the floor to you, Elizabeth Thompson. Um, and uh, very much looking forward to your discussion. Thank you so much, Michael, for the very, very kind and flattering introduction to uh, me. I welcome you all to our panel titled The Holocaust, Antisemitism, and the Memory of the Jewish Past in the Arab World. Uh, this is a uh, topic that is an, um, really represents um, one half of a, a burgeoning new and a very important field that is seeking to recapture a past that has been erased, silenced, and forgotten over the course of a very traumatic 20th century. Um, as Michael Brenner uh, mentioned in his introduction of me, my work has concerned interfaith governance and political movements in the Eastern Arab world. Um, and uh, particularly in my recent book, I looked at how uh, 1920 in Syria, uh, an Islamic scholar presided over a constitutional Congress that for the first time disestablished Islam in favor of Islamic values of equality, justice, and tolerance, uh, making for the first time truly uh, Christians and Jews equal citizens in the polity. Um, what is striking, and the reason I wrote that book, is that is no longer the case. Uh, since the 1950s, nearly every Arab country has a clause in its constitution rooting legislation in Islamic law. And so it is one of the great puzzles of 20th century history that while we have seen the burgeoning of mass movements seeking freedom from tyranny, freedom from colonial rule, um, the establishment of social justice and rights for all. We have also seen the closing down of politics and a kind of um, sectarianization um, uh, uh, become quite entrenched, not only in the more notorious cases of Lebanon, but elsewhere. Um, let me introduce our uh, speakers for today. Menaz Afridi is the Associate Professor of Religious Studies and the Director of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College in the Bronx, New York. She is author of Shoah Through Muslim Eyes, published in 2017, 
and many articles and book chapters on Muslims' role in and memory of the Holocaust, as well as on interreligious relations more generally. Our second speaker will be Robert Satloff. He is the executive director of the Washington Institute of Near East Policy and holder of its Howard P. Berkowitz Chair in U.S. Middle East Policy. He is author, most importantly for our session today, of the book, Among the Righteous, Lost Stories of the Holocaust's Long Reach into Arab Lands, published in 2006, which was the basis of a 2010 uh, PBS documentary, and potentially, I learned today, a future movie read out of Hollywood. Uh, 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 Professor Satloff is uh, author and uh, editor of eight additional books and monographs and of numerous articles in news newspapers and presentations in the media. Our third speaker today is Professor Omar Boom. He is the Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of California in Los Angeles and author of Memories of Absence, How Muslims Remember Jews in Morocco, published in 2013, and a recently edited volume uh, with Sarah Stein entitled The Holocaust and North Africa. He has written numerous articles and chapters on representations of religious and ethnic minorities in North Africa and the Middle East. We come together to uh, present what I feel as a historian as an important new uh, historiography on uh, an understudied field and that is um, the ways in which in the mid 20th century, the, the story of the Holocaust and the trauma it caused amongst Jews, amongst Europeans, and its effects in, in the Middle East, which is a neglected sector, and World War II clashed with as well the uh, story of decolonization, the fight, against, fight for independence from European colonial empires. Both colonialism and the Holocaust were manifestations of European racism that was hitched particularly powerfully and in deadly ways in the 19th century to the expansive colonialism of European empires. Um, we, unfortunately though, in uh, scholarship, have only recently and only rarely linked the violence against Jews in Europe to the violence of colonial wars of expansion and to the more generalized construction of a, a hateful enemy other, right? Um, uh, the complex relationship of the project then of Zionists to create a safe haven for Jews from Europe and to settle in Palestine necessarily and tragically crossed into um, uh, the project of peoples who lived in the region and particularly Arab peoples to gain independence from the very colonial empires that were helping Zionists establish their haven. And so it is this complex history that accounts in part, as our speakers have uh, noted in the prefaces to their own books, for the silence and the misunderstanding and um, the forgetfulness of a past history of coexistence and of a past history and the po even the possibility or memory of um, uh, a relationship where Arabs, uh, Muslim Arabs, even Christian Arabs may have participated in the rescue of Jews in the Holocaust. I think it is fitting this fall as the United Nations celebrates its 75th anniversary and in which the leaders in that forum called for in September, the final decolonization of a world that still suffers the legacies of colonial rule and of a racist imperialism down to today that we approach then the, uh, the, the tragic um, emotional and intellectual legacies that have allowed for a deformation of information and memory of what happened in the 1940s and afterward, and in keeping with the theme of this series of um, the, the rise of a different kind of anti-Semitism, if you will, following the Holocaust. I'll end my introduction with um, just a little bit of a quote from a Lebanese historian, uh, Elias Khoury, who wrote a foreword to a recent volume called The Holocaust and the Nakba, the Nakba being the catastrophe uh, the Palestinians felt upon um, their expulsion from Palestine after 1948 and their lingering and continuing um, uh, 
a lim if you will, living in limbo uh, without a state, right? He notes and warns us about the complexity of the language that we use and of the categories that we use, that their meaning is rarely transparent and that there are hidden connections amongst words um, that we use like Holocaust and like Nakba, um, both terms he notes that are a link catastrophe to the legacy of European colonialism and racism. He writes in the introduction to the volume that the two events were fused after 1948 um, in the minds of both Arabs and Jews, that the young Israeli state mobilized the Holocaust politically, which would feed into the ways in which, as we'll see in a few moments, um, Arabs would choose to remember or not remember the Holocaust. And so too did mo Palestinians mobilize their Nakba as the beginning of a continuing disaster. He reminds us, however, that the two terms have a common origin and a common meaning in a common struggle of humanity against racism. And so I uh, applaud our scholars, and I hope we'll start a conversation today that uh, advances the kind of linked and relational history with careful nuance rather than polemic um, as we try to retrieve the human experience and the linkages that we all have um, amongst one another. So let us begin then with uh, Professor Afridi, uh, author of Shoah Through Muslim eyes. Welcome. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was so rich. I just was like, okay, we we'll just keep listening to that um, um, uh, kind of summary. I really want to thank American University and Michael Brenner um, and Laura Cutler who put this together. And I'm really honored that I'm with Robert and Omar um, on this panel. And I've been following their work. I teach their work. I hope my students are here because they just read Robert's book in my class and we'll be reading an article by Omar. So I just wanted to say a few words about my work. Um, I wrote Shoah Through Muslim Eyes as both uh, academic, but also a personal journey. I wanted people in the larger public to um, listen to a Muslim woman who was acknowledging the Holocaust and talking about the complexity of the Holocaust, but also the complexity of, of colonization. And I think it was a question of acknowledging one another and one another's suffering in terms of who we are as human beings, uh, especially me being a Muslim and doing Holocaust work in terms of looking at Judaism. My other kind of question always, and it's still a lingering question, is how do we remember one another? Um, in what context and what do we do with that memory in terms of future generations? And as a religious studies scholar, um, I find that Jews and Muslims have a very packaged kind of way of seeing interreligious uh, um, relations. And I wanted to break that and talk about the complexity of it, um, not just in the Arab North, North African context, but also in the contemporary context, uh, whether it's Asian uh, Muslims, African Muslims, European Muslims. So primarily I work on two sides of the coin. I teach classes on the Holocaust and I teach classes on Islam. So every day I'm dealing with uh, the complexity of antisemitism and Islamophobia. But the main point, and I think the main thing I wanted to do, both on an academic, intellectual, and emotional level, was to put on a piece of paper as a Muslim the acknowledgement and full historical fact of the Shoah. Um, throughout my book, I keep consistent with the word Shoah rather than the Holocaust, and I talk about my preference for that word. Um, I also asked, asked the Jewish audience in my book to actually read about colonization and the impact of that on um, all Muslims basically in all Muslim countries. So as myself, a Pakistani coming from a colonized country, one of the longstanding colonizations, um, still having connections there, my whole family still lives there and goes there all the time. This was a very important book for me. Um, and it was a book about peace uh, and courage and to be self-critical of one's own absence of memory, or I would say repression of memory, or I would say the eradication of one another's memory. Thank you. Thank you so much, doc, uh, Dr. Afridi. Now our next speaker is uh, Robert Satloff of the uh, Washington Institute of Near East Policy. Welcome, Robert. Good morning and uh, thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor Thompson and my friends Menez and Omar and 
thank you, Michael and, and Laura, for inviting me to participate. Um, I'm really delighted that uh, that AU is taking um, is having its students focus on this issue. Um, uh, my own uh, work on uh, looking at Holocaust memory in the Arab world uh, started 20 years ago, um, or almost 20 years ago, on 9/11. Uh, it's a rather convoluted story, but let's just say that my whole objective here is to try to find a way to talk to Arabs about the Holocaust um, that, um, that makes it part of their story. And I didn't know it at the time, um, but I just assumed that, uh, that there was a their story. And so I then spent the next uh, several years investigating their story. Um, and I came to learn that for three years from uh, May of, uh, of uh, uh, from throughout um, uh, uh, from May of 1940 to May of 1943, um, Arab countries, certainly in North Africa, um, uh, under um, uh, Nazi, Vichy, Italian fascist control, um, uh, imposed on their Jewish populations almost all of the same aspects of persecution that were, as were imposed on the Jewish populations of Europe to varying degrees and various extent, except for extermination. Of course, that's a huge except um, uh, when one thinks of the Shoah, uh, but when one thinks of it from the bottom up in terms of um, uh, discrimination and bias and impact on, on property and life and schools and, and daily existence, it's an enormous uh, impact. Um, and so um, I, I, I sought to tell their story, um, and then I sought to tell the story of the Arabs around them, who actually, as, it, as I came to learn, experienced almost the exact same role in that story as did Europeans in the European version of the Holocaust. Uh, participants, um, uh, 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 resistance, um, and bystanders. And to tell that story, and especially to tell the story from my perspective of those Arabs who, who risked their lives to save Jews, in my view, opened up a new window to try to talk with Arab and Muslim populations about the Holocaust today. Um, uh, I will, um, uh, th th this is a discussion about Holocaust memory. I think what's important to note is the victors get to write the history. So if you look at, for example, um, uh, just the three countries, um, three French countries in North Africa, French speaking countries that I focused on, Tunisia, Algeria, and, and Morocco, um, only one is, is governed today by essentially the same regime that was in power to a certain extent um, 75 years ago, and that's Morocco. And so you have a great pride um, in Morocco today about the role that the monarchy played 75 years ago. The other two countries, Algeria and Tunisia, um, uh, history is, has gone through, 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 through various um, uh, uh, evolutions. Each regime gets to rewrite it the way they'd like their people to see it. And so you don't have um, 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 uh, contemporary leaders um, projecting the same pride, even if, as in both Tunisia and Algeria, there were remarkable stories, um, uplifting, positive stories of Arabs protecting, saving, um, uh, um, um, uh, 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 working on behalf of their fellow Jews. Um, trying to unleash that, trying to bring that back, has been something that I've been trying to do for the last 15 or so years. I've had the privilege of lecturing in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Egypt, and Jordan, and in Jerusalem, in Arab universities on these issues. And I can say there's a thirst. There's a, there is a real thirst for understanding of what the history really is. Um, uh, the last comment is, you can even begin to see it from Muslim groups in those countries today. So for Morocco today, there is a an organization of mostly young um, Muslims called Memuna, which is um, uh, which is investing in bringing back Jewish culture and and appreciating Jewish culture in Morocco today. Even in Tunisia, there was a um, an exhibit not too long ago put on by the U.S. Holocaust Museum um, of uh, propaganda, um, looking through the eyes of the Holocaust era propaganda. But it, it struck a note among Tunisians about how propaganda can be used today, just the same way it might have been used 75 years ago. There is a connection, there is a thirst, and I believe that with effort by scholars such as Omar and Menaz 
um, we can bring back the conversation about uh, the historical memory um, of Jews and Arabs, Jews and Muslims in all these countries from generations ago. Thank you so much, Robert. And our third speaker is Omar Boom of UCLA, author of Memory of Absence. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thompson, for the introduction. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to share this stage with Rob and uh, Menaz, uh, who share whose, whose work is in conversation with many aspects of my work. So let me, I'm gonna say a little bit about my ethnographic work because I think it's central to understanding history and to uh, have a conversation with history, which is also central to what I do. So I call myself a historical anthropologist so history and anthropology are in conversation all the time in my work. Uh, I, I grew up in, or I came of age in, in Morocco in the 1980s, 1990s, where conversation about Israel-Palestine in Moroccan public universities in Marrakesh that I attended were central. So um, going and doing a PhD at the University of Arizona um, and starting to think about the Jewish memory uh, I really wanted to figure out a way how to understand how Muslims or how different generations of Muslims remember, construct, think about Jews and Judaism today. In, uh, as the country went from about 240,000 Jews in the mid, in, in mid 20th century to less than 3,000 Jews today. So this idea of the physical absence where does, how does this physical absence translate when it comes to memory, but not especially to generational memory. So the work that I've done, I didn't focus on cities because I knew that there is the, the, the discourse there would be much more in, in connection with the center, the, the heartland of the Middle East. So I went to uh, areas where there were a lot of Jews in the South, in Saharan, in the Saharan region and Jewish history and Muslim history was, was entangled, was, 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 was entangled together. So, so I wanted, I, I decided to do a four, a, a work on four generations uh, from the same family sometimes, the great grandparents, the grandparents, the parents, and the young adults. And for me, uh, carrying out this ethnographic work, I first of all figured out exactly how do people still remember these Jewish communities? Is there still a connection that exists between the Muslims and Jews and Jews today who are out there living either in France or in Ashdod or in uh, Beersheba and so on and so forth. So, so that's, that's the start. For me, that was the starting point is first of all to see where memory fits and how can we move from the, the, the stage of memory to the nation state. So the idea is uh, to uh, once, we, once I understood, first of all, this, that there is the Arab-Israeli conflict is definitely at the center of the construction of this memory, but it's not in the same way that among all the generations. Definitely the, greater, the great grandparents and the grandparents generation definitely uh, had a different way of understanding this context. But the younger generation is, as, as most of you would probably um, uh, conclude, um, definitely, construct this memory through its present moment. So, so, so that's why I moved from the, the, this small place in the southern part of Morocco to the nation state. So for me, constructing about how the nation constructs and sees and uses this history in not only internally, but also externally. So the politics of memory are tied also with the politics of representation and the politics of what I call foregrounding and the backgrounding of Jewish history. And, and so not only in terms of museums, but also in terms of uh, movie and, and, and cinematic production. So all of these things are also tied to the use, how uh, the conservation of Jewish history, conservation of Jewish uh, cemeteries, the, 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 and also the connections between Morocco as a state, as a nation and its Jewish, and its Jewish diaspora, not only within Israel, but also uh, outside of Israel. And then the, the, the third point for me that was in, essential is the translation of this work into Arabic and French. Well, I, I, I work from within the American university, I, um, but for me, I really don't talk to American and American audience or Western audience. For me, the, the, the conversation is with Moroccans. So that's why 
the idea of translating my work, I, I, I try as much as I can to translate my work into two languages, into French and into Arabic. And, and the both work are circulated. I think I, uh, as much as I was concerned about the perception because I wanted the people that I studied to, to see, to, to, to be in conversation with them. And I think they have been, the conversation has been very fruitful and, have, and very constructive until today, until today. And, I, and I would say one last thing, one last thing is about um, the, where, the, where I see the loopholes. I think, I, I think the Jewish history in Morocco and the, the rest of North Africa is very rich. It's part of the identity of those countries. It's part of the identity of the region. Uh, people are aware of it, but I think that the next step is how to translate this knowledge we know about these communities, not only to the university, because I think universities have done a good job as far as the work. You have Moroccans, uh, Muslims studying these topics, engaging with these topics, but how does it fit in the, the middle school and the high school? And I think that's where a lot of things has to be still done, and because that's when you talk about memory and the translation of memory and where you move forward with the, with the next generation, I think making sure that the, the generation of the, uh, that younger generation is aware of that history through textbooks, through history textbooks. And, and that's, I think, where a lot of work needs to be done, not only in Morocco, but I think in the rest of the Arab world and the Middle East and North Africa, as well as I think that has worked the same work that has to be done also in Europe and Israel too. And Thank I end there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's hope that's not the end, but just the start of a rich conversation, which the three of you have already begun with one another, teaching one another's works in classrooms and so on. Maybe we should start with that question of education and, um, and of ignorance and of generations, you know, oh, actually, let me run this back. I want to start with a question with, to Professor Boom, who in your book, you found that memory was conditioned very differently amongst the generations, that the oldest generation who had actual memories of living alongside Jews had a very different reference to younger students who had never met Jews and who were more exposed through current curricula in schools to a, uh, a very different, and as I think you suggested in your introduction, um, to looking at Jews through the prism of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, would you elaborate a little bit on that? And then I, I think as well, I think um, in your work, both Robert and Menaz, you, you have also had to grapple with perhaps change over time in knowledge and memory. But uh, let's start with Professor Boom. So I think, I think that's, uh, that's really an excellent question. I, I think when you look at those communities, these, the communities that I began my work with, are rural communities, southern communities. They are tied in an economy of farming and subsistence and agriculture. So the, the, the connections between the different groups were tied at least until the 1970s, I'll say, because of the lack of migration, not only internal, but also external migration. So once you have a shift in terms of labor and you start seeing, or at least in terms of education, when, when, when the younger generation starts to to go to schools and leave the villages, I think that at least from what I've noticed as far as the conversations between the older generation and the younger generation, it's not seen a crisis of transmission of memory. Mm -hmm. And I think that crisis of transmission of memory has been taken and replaced by what happens, the circle that happens in university or that happens in schools. And I can speak even for myself too. And, and, and that void needs to be filled with very constructive educational curriculum. And that's, I think, where the missing point is, is that you don't, you, you, I'm not suggesting that you can't have those conversations about the Arab-Israeli conflict and, and, and within Moroccan circles. But I think you, you, what you're missing also, you're missing about the complexities and the nuances and the richness mm -hmm. of a Jewish history that it's absent in many ways from those textbooks and from those history books. And, and a, a lot of people, sorry, last point, and, and Simon Levy, for instance, the, the, the director of the, or the founder of the Jewish Museum of Casablanca has written a lot about this in the 80s. A Moroccan Jewish intellectual uh, has written a lot about this and has really highlighted these, this very important issue. Okay, so maybe we can make a link here and uh, give me a moment to do so um, because you're, me you're mentioning a younger generation that seems to be opposing 
what Robert referred to as a kind of official pride in having saved and shielded Jews from Vichy France and from the Nazis in World War II. Could the two of you speak to that? I mean, there seems to be a, is there a, a sort of, um, um, I, mean, I don't know what is teach, taught in schools, but the, to a degree that I have visited Morocco and seen, you know, with great pride, um, a tour guide show me the old Jewish quarter and, uh, you know, in Casablanca and so on, right? Um, uh, or uh, you know, what, what is happening with memory there? Um, uh, on one hand, there is a pride in the past. On the other hand, is there a rejection of that narrative, Omar? I don't know. Um, you know, is there still a memory that the king had shielded Jews in the 1940s? Yes, yes, I think that's that's a very that's a dominant uh, uh, part of the of the memory, and uh, and I think and I think there is also the pride in the Jewish heritage. There is the fact when you the reason why you, you go to cemeteries now in Morocco is still intact. There is no is no targeting of Jewish, uh, 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 and not only there is no targeting of Jewish sites and cemeteries and shrines. But it's also conserved. Uh, there is a huge conservation effort. So they, I'm not talking about the, that that side. I'm talking also about the level of how you carry out the memory. The, the memory also has to be carried out through schooling and through education. So the university has done a good job as far as the research. There is no doubt about that. There is, but but I think there is also another element where if you want to create and maintain that same level where it's happened at the level of universities, right. you have also to inject a new life through primary, secondary, and high school education. Okay, uh, Manas, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I mean, I I want to kind of shift it a little bit, if that's possible. And, um, but one of the one of the problems in terms of education and curriculum, and it's not just in Morocco, but it's in many other countries, Arab and non-Arab, Asian and African, is that. Um, this idea that the locus of, say, in the 19, 1980s and 90s that you're talking about in terms of situating oneself in Israel and Palestine, right, the whole complexity of that, there was a physical eradication of the word Israel and Jew out of textbooks, which I witnessed myself um, as a child in the Middle East. Uh, so there is a kind of force, that's why I call eradication of memory, right? Uh, eradication of memory is not that, oh, Jews are Jews are not even existent in these textbooks that um, uh, we had to read. And they were done by, these textbooks were um, written by Europeans. Um, and the supervisors would come and they would block out this word Jew in Israel. The other thing I want to say is that I think the education curriculum is really important, Omar, but I also think that I'm really interested in the people on the street. Uh, because it disturbs me when I go to an airport in, somewhere, which is predominantly Muslim country, where there's Mein Kampf being sell, sold, um, or when there's a, a clothing store that's called Hitler. So, I mean, and there, it's not, it's, it's a, this unconscious sort of idea on the street that this is all okay because of the lack of the education, not just in the curriculum, because that would be another process in, in all of these different education systems. But the sort of common um, culture or ethos that goes on in terms of the conspiracy against the Jews, anti-Semitism, and all of that. So I'm really, really, really fascinated with looking at pop culture, right? And what's on the street in terms of the streets of Cairo or Karachi or, you know, different places in the world where these things are just part of the consciousness and not questioned anymore as being racist or problematic. Uh, and it's because of the vacuum of that pre preservation of Jewish memory, but also the eradication of a memory. And I think that is something we need to talk about is how does that memory just go away, right? So, I mean, a lot of the times when I talk about colonization, I always say to Muslim students or Muslim audiences, you can't get rid of your colonial mindset. It's part of your DNA. Um, so you can't just deracinate and say, oh, I no longer, uh, I'm influenced by the Christian, Christian missionaries, or I'm no longer influenced by the language of the French or the language of the British. Um, it becomes part of that. And I think we're so prone to separate our history and the imprints that we forget and eradicate what really disturbs us. And I think there's something interesting in terms of the uncanny of memory, what makes us feel really uncomfortable, um, 
And I think that has to be worked on in the education system, of course, because I love teaching and I'm an educator. But primarily, I think pop culture, you know, like just the culture on the street and um, how people think about the notion of the other, especially the Jew in my part of the world, which is the Muslim world. Robert, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, um, I, I want to tell a, a very quick story that illustrates uh, the, uh, uh, not just the disappearance of memory, but the twisting. Um, uh, uh, and I think there's a hopeful end to all this. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful story I tell in my book about the mayor of Tunis who saved uh, um, about 60 Jews during uh, um, uh, World War II who escaped from a, a German labor camp and showed up at his farm. And he protected them throughout the balance of the war. Now, this story is written about in books um, um, by the Jewish community in the late in the mid and late 1940s. Um, so it's printed; it's it's out there. That's why the subtitle of my book is not is, is about the lost stories. These stories were known. Um, so I went to try to find the kids and grandkids of that wonderful Arab mayor who saved these Jews. And when I found them, they told a completely different story, not about their grandfather having protected 60 Jews, but their grandfather having protected German POWs who escaped from an allied um, uh, POW camp just after the conclusion of the war. Now there's zero evidence to suggest the POW story is true. Um, the saving of the Jews is, is confirmed by lots of testimonies. But somewhere, that story was transformed in the 50s and the 60s and the height of Nasserism and, and, um, uh, uh, and the, the birth of Republicanism in, uh, in Tunisia and across the Middle East. It became impossible to tell a story about just saving Jews, having nothing to do with Israel. Now, I think that there is a movement now to reclaim that history. And the, the grandchildren do not fight the history of their grandfather once it is explained to them. They actually, most of them, now embrace it. And I think that if you, that, 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 uh, uh, that type of re-embracing, um, putting it into the context of the day, is something that we as historians and scholars can help. Because I think there's a thirst now. I think there is a desire for young um, Arabs in many countries to know a lot more. They realize that their elders, um, their parents and grandparents, and the people who've been running their governments for the last 30, 40, 50 years have been denying them all sorts of things, including their own history. And I think that there is a thirst um, uh, and a receptivity. How one does it, the sensitivity of how one approaches it, it's a challenge. But I think that, that there is an enormous desire out there to be, um, to, to, to give, um, uh, to let them reclaim their own history. I, I just want to make one point in terms of education. I do believe, because there are many organizations I work with that are doing Holocaust education in places that are very impossible, like Pakistan, where I'm from, um, but they actually work. Holocaust education works in a way um, that I think most people don't understand. Um, and, you know, yesterday I, I gave a presentation on Muslim victimization and somebody asked me, well, why would people be interested in that? Because, you know, Muslims and Arabs are seen as aggressors. And I thought to myself, well, the same reason why Muslims wouldn't be interested in Jews being victims, right? Like if there's this kind of weird idea that somehow, you know, we can't see the victimization of the other. Um, <clears throat> and if we do that, we somehow become less victim, right? So that's called in genocide studies, Olympics of of, um, of genocide. But I think that, you know, when you start to talk about the Holocaust in the context of history, um, and then you pull in North Africa, and you start talking about the Vichy, and what happened in North Africa, students are like, wait, what? And you have to also educate them about colonial history. So in a sense, you're doing all these different pieces at one time. Um, and it's a very challenging class to teach, because you're, you have to, you have to, A, your students have to have colonial history, they have to know something about Islam. They have to know something about Judaism. They have to have the history of the Holocaust. And then you're like, whoa. And then when you give them narratives and testimonies, whether they're Tunisian 
Jewish survivors and what they witnessed, right, or bystanders, um, that's when things start clicking, the narrative, right, the testimony, the personal stories, and then they go, wow. So there are ways to do that, um, but it's very hard to get into the educational system in many places. Now, I want to remind you that only 20% of the Muslim world is Arab. We keep forgetting that. So there's a huge part of the Muslim world that we still need to address in terms of anti-Semitism or these issues of memory and whose memory and how we think of Jews um, themselves. Perhaps we can jump off of that a little bit in distinguishing Arab from Muslim and um, establishing co contexts in which memory is formed. Um, to what degree is it related to being Muslim that you would erase you know, is that the category we want to be using? Um, and when we want, want to speak about the erasure of the uh, memory of the Holocaust or the distortion of that memory, to what degree do we want other frames, uh, um, you know, in our analysis? Uh, is there is a, um, and perhaps maybe we could um, uh, uh, address this question a little bit in, in terms of, um, I think our students and our audience might appreciate your insights and your experience in conducting the interviews that you did and the the ways in which the, the either victims or you know neighbors who were uh, 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 interviewed or grandchildren who were interviewed what categories were they using when they described their relationship to the Jewish victims of the Holocaust is that uh, did that raise any issues for you in doing your own work uh, okay can I have a take on it. I, yeah. I think that's a great, that's a great question. I think, and I think it ties into what uh, Menaz and Rob are, are highlighting as far as how, how we, the, not only the historical knowledge, but also the sensitivity of the, being aware of the perspective of the informant. I, when I did, when I did my, my ethnographic work, I, I was very careful to never name things from my own standpoint. Uh, perspective as a scholar who has this luggage coming with this discourse from a Jewish studies or Holocaust studies, but I, I, I let people talk about their relations with, with, with Jews. They talk about um, uh, partnerships, economic partnerships. They talk about uh, social gathering. They talk about visit, talking to the rabbis and so on and so forth. And the discourse, the, 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 the terminology, I agree with you. I think there is an indigenous terminology that shifts depending on the time, from whether you use the word Yahudi or Israeli or, 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 or other terms, I think those are things that I think we have to be aware of. I, I think there is also the challenge of how we translate this knowledge to a general public or general audiences, not only an American audience, but also um, a Middle Eastern and North African audience. But I, do, but I do agree with you, I think um, letting people, first of all, allowing, if we want to insert whatever category we want to talk about, Arab, Muslim, Christian, Middle Eastern, Arab, or Middle Eastern, Muslim, or Middle Eastern, Christian, in this Jewish story, we have also to make sure that this is a story that's being told from their own perspective with a critical mind, uh, with a critical analysis, but it has to include the categories that these people are uh, used, because that's what, this is the first step, the first stage for us to first of all figure out a way of how to when when you get to the second level of how to what to make of this research, especially if you think of, start thinking about the policy making. Because at the end of the day, I think as researchers, we uh, for me as personally, I think our knowledge should not be within say within the walls of universities. I think our knowledge has to be serve the general public, and that's the challenge we have as scholars and and as researchers. Just, just a word. I, I agree completely with what uh, what Omar just said. Um, I, the grayness of the of this issue uh, strikes me every time I look at it again. Um, the uh, 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 there is nothing black and white about this history. There are um, uh, 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 it's it's not Arabs and Jews. It's not Muslims and Jews. It's you have to look d uh, individually at different countries and regions, there's Berbers and, uh, and Arabs, there's, there's um, uh, Europeanized um, local elites versus um, uh, um, different groups that are 
um, uh, that, are, that had nothing to do with European culture whatsoever. Same on the Jewish side. Um, Jews who have been in, in this part of the world for 2,000 years versus Jews who are much more recent arrivals and much more Europe, Europeanized in their, their culture and outlook. It's um, the, the, the complexity of the relationships, you know, differ across the Middle East. Um, and so, and, and even more broadly in um, you know, the Muslim world, a term I'm not a big fan of, but um, uh, 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 still there are some basic commonalities. And the one that I tried to underscore is agency, is that uh, no, regardless of whether you were under um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the most vicious form of European colonialism, everybody made a choice. Everybody had a choice to a certain extent of um, during this period and later on of bystander, uh, participant, or a rescuer. Um, uh, and th the choice is blurred to be sure, but everybody had a choice. And, re and reminding people that even at the worst moments of history, everybody has a choice. They have a choice today, and they had a choice 75 years ago, is I think an important aspect of the education, um, which I totally agree needs to get much lower than the, the progress that we've made at universities, but much lower um, and much broader than we've been able to do so far. Manas, did you want to comment? I mean, you go, you discuss at length, I think, in your book, um, the degrees to which there's anything within Islam, essentially, that uh, shapes the way uh, in Mus you know, the Muslims you've interviewed uh, uh, respond, but the ways in which it does not, too. Yeah, I mean, again, re religious studies person, but I have a chapter um, that is called, is Islam anti-Semitic? And then comma, no, is what I say. Um, so one of, one of the things that, you know, like I said, I, I'm dealing with anti-Semitism, but also Islamophobia, and I spend a lot of time, uh, not just in the classroom, but at, at synagogues and mosques and doing a lot of partnerships in, in the Riverdale, New York area, and also internationally in places like Bosnia uh, and Turkey because I run the center. So there's a lot of initiatives that we do all over for Holocaust education, but also Muslim education. So one of the things that I found um, very interesting was that a lot of uh, Jews in the audience would ask me why the Quran was anti-Semitic, you know, and they would refer to certain things and certain verses that are problematic in the Quran. So what I did was in that book was to flesh out these verses and say, yes, this could be seen this way, and this could be seen that way, and this is what actually the Hadith says, and this is what the Quran says, right? So just to flesh out the religious sort of um, libel, in a sense, against Muslims being anti-Semitic inherently if we are Muslims. The second point I think um, that I looked at was when I interviewed Muslims and anti-Semitism and what they thought about Jews was that a lot of them didn't really know why they were anti-Semitic, right? There was a sort of like loss of memory oh, I think they did something terrible to us at the time of Muhammad. And I'm like, okay, can you recount that story? No, I don't remember, but we shouldn't like them. So the memory was very diffused and very strange. It wasn't just about Israel and Palestine. Um, there was a lot of these lapses and these gaps and fissures that was like, oh, I think um, they are controlling um, our countries. Okay, so, okay, so I'd say, okay, how so? Like, explain that. And there was just kind of, silence or this kind of withdrawal of, I don't know why I'm saying this. I have no idea. This is why I'm talking about this memory being so deeply ingrained. And these are young people. I'm talking about people in their 20s um, that are in college or just, just out of college working. So I think this is really important for us to think about is that, and we know that. About, I mean, if you teach the Holocaust, you know that the myth, myth around the Jew is, is, is a fabrication, but not just overnight between 1933 and 1945, but it comes from all the way back to Christianity, right? Um, through the movement of medieval times and, and uh, with Jews living under Christians. So these are long standing myths that become real. And these myths, as we know, were transported a lot of the European myths into the Arab world. And David Matadil has an excellent book about Islam and Germany that 
explains this beautifully. And there was propaganda sent into the Arab world because the Germans wanted allies. And, the, and a lot of the times uh, when you think about this, you're like, okay, well, they bought this. Well, they bought this because they were vulnerable and they saw Jews as colonial. They did not see Jews in terms of looking at Palestine as Jews or Arab Jews or European Jews. They saw this kind of perception. And this, this point of history is so important. If we could just say, look at the perception we had of one another at a moment of time from the 1920s all the way to the 1940s and what was going on in terms of the Holocaust and colonization. And this kind of, if, if you can educate people about this perception and have them just sit back and look at their own perception of what that period was, I think you can really change and transform people's thinking and get them excited about, wow, I can see this differently now, right? That, that Israel becomes this colonial t state, the Jews become European, they don't look like Arabs, they don't act like Arabs, and they are Europeans, right? I mean, they come into uh, uh, Palestine. So these are really important things in terms of memory, how we see it and how we perceive that. And I, I talk about this in my book, but I also teach about this all the time. And I have my students sit back and kind of meditate on this moment. Um, because then you have an exchange of perception, whether it's negative or whether it's positive, but it's real. And that perception goes down to other generations. So returning to our, um, getting to the point where we need to open things up to our uh, audience who've kindly been listening and patiently waiting to ask their own questions. But um, I think in your book, and as you just said uh, eloquently now, um, to what degree then should we outline a, a level of research or further research, for example, on the specific ways in which I, I think if I'm reading your argument correctly is that the kind of anti-Semitism we're dealing with today in the Arab world is not deeply rooted in Islam, um, is a very recent vintage. Some scholars have pointed to Nazi propaganda problematically. There's been a bit of pushback on some of the books that have come out. To what degree did Arabs even read or hear that propaganda, much less how do we know whether they took Nazi messages to heart? To what degree, um, and this is the elephant in the room, uh, was it the political exploitation of the 1948 war and the displacement of Palestinians and the bitterness? I mean, you know, I let me just say this. I, I did do a bit of research for a chapter in one of my books on one of the leaders of the PLO, uh, Abu Yad, right? And my question there was, how did this man, if you read in Arabic, his writings, the biographies of him and so on, how did this man not realize that organizing a capture of hostages in Munich of all places in 1972 in the Olympics was not going to send a horrific and counterproductive message about where Palestinians are coming from. You know, and what I was astonished to learn as I did my research into Arabic sources was that the man didn't know much, even by 1972, about the Holocaust. But if you look back into his own memoirs, what he did know was that he grew up in Jaffa, you know, in a neighborhood that bordered Tel Aviv. Um, he had memories of his father speaking Hebrew to Jewish customers in their grocery store, right? And that he blamed Europeans for destroying the coexistence that they felt. That's generation one. What happens after generation two, after 1972? And, and the, uh, the political circumstances and the enduring non-resolution of what writers like Elias Hori point to as a companion, albeit lesser catastrophe, right? Palestinians were displaced, they were not murdered en masse, right? But it is a stumbling block to see that your disaster is not being recognized and yet the other is. Perhaps maybe we can make a few comments on that before we turn to the, the Q&A. To what degree does this have to become a relational and mutual investigation on um, memories of um, the separate catastrophes. Anybody want to take a piece of that? I, I, I think, uh, first of all, thanks, Liz, for mentioning this 
uh, this example because I think it's really at the heart of our obligations and the obligations within Jewish studies and Holocaust studies to open its doors to scholars who work on it, who work with different languages and different backgrounds. And 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 I think that for me personally, uh, moving from as a historical anthropologist, moving from Jewish Muslim memories to Holocaust studies and Holocaust uh, work, I think it's it's really linked to this to this to, to this to this to this project. Why? Because as you said, we do know we do have uh, documentation in other languages in Arabic. We we, we do have um, access to memories, still living memories about this period. So so more research needs to be done on this and I think uh, I applaud a lot of institutions, including the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, were basically opening its doors to a lot of scholars who are working on these topics from different backgrounds, from West Africa to North Africa to the Middle East. And I think that's really um, a step, first of all, to broaden the knowledge and to add another layer of complexity to this understanding and to this research. Because you're right, those stories really make things much more clear instead of just reading things from the, the present moment. Robert, any concluding thoughts before we open up for uh, Q&A? Well, look, j just on this issue, um, uh, uh, first, I think the Palestinian his story is, is not unique in the broader Arab story, but it is, um, it is more intense than any other, I mean, more intense than the Moroccan narrative or the Algerian narrative or Tunisian or Libyan or whatever. Um, uh, and it, it is a, you know, it, it is an, a, 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 a deeply personal engagement with um, uh, what happened in uh, 48 and beyond. Um, uh, uh, here, in, in all my lectures in Arab countries, when, when this issue emerges, um, um, I ask my audiences, let's get on the history train. If you want to get off in 1940, let's get off in 1940. If you want to get off in 42, let's get off in 42. If you want to stay on all the way to 48, I'll stay on all the way to 48. But you can't refuse to get on the train. Um, uh, uh, and if you, you know, because it's your history. Um, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if 48 is too painful because it, it suggests all sorts of things about Jewish power and, and, it, and it transforms your image of the world in a topsy-turvy way, because for the first time Jews are exercising sovereignty, exercising power in a in a in a uh, in a in a region where they had never done so before, and and that is so alien that it's difficult to embrace. That's fine. We won't even go there. We'll get off. We'll stop by forty-three. But please don't say you won't go up to me, go up with me through 43, 44, 45. And, and I'd say the vast majority of people are willing to, to do that, putting aside what happens afterwards, knowing that that is a much more difficult and complex story. It doesn't mean we don't do it, but give everyone the option of getting off the train wherever they feel comfortable. Right. But even, I had a colleague at UVA uh, who taught a fabulous course on you know, uh, Jewish Muslim memories of the of 1948. Um, you know, a highly uh, popular course. Um, what what you notice even amongst Palestinian Arabs, though, in those first few years, is two things. One, admiration. Abu Iyad read Menachem Begin's book. Oh, so he figured out how to get rid of the British colonizers, right? Um, maybe we can learn from them. There was an admiration that they had decolonized. But then a bitterness sets in, where's our independence? Where's, our, where's the UN in recognizing you know, that, that? I'm not sure. I think the, the, you know, we, we need a better and richer history of how memory and experience and attitudes unfold in relationship and reaction to one another, as opposed to the stories that I think state leaders have imposed upon us um, for their own purposes, no if you Absolutely. will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Manas, a thought? We really should get our questions. We're running a little low on time. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I constantly talk about this perception, you know, and I, I agree with Robert. It could be 
It, ha like it doesn't have to be 1948, right? It can be before that. Um, but I also, I also think that there should be conversations about difficult contemporary times between Jews and Muslims, um, and that we shouldn't just historicize, right? So there's a tendency for people to have nostalgia of how Jews and Muslims were just brothers and sisters during this, you know, wonderful time and the, what the, was called the golden age in Spain. And there were good times, but there was still anti-Semitism and there was still resentment, right? So, I mean, I think one of the things that, and I think Robert said this earlier, it's not a black and white history, yeah. right? And it's never going to be a black and white history because human beings are complicated, whether you're Jewish or Muslim or Christian or Hindu or whatever you are. And I think that's where we like to organize our lives in a, in a way that is black and white. Um, and when those things become really blurry, we sort of get uncomfortable. You know, we want to see these things encased in a way. So I always encourage my students that if you are confused in my class, that's a good sign. I've done something good here, right? <laughs> um, but if, <laughs> if you're coming out and saying, oh, I know everything about Muslims in the Holocaust, well, this is just a taster. It's a taster to throw out yeah. things at you to kind of explore and think about in the future. So I think that's what I want to say in terms of yeah. human complexity human complexity is so needed, especially today in the world. Yes, thank you. I, I, I agree. Um, given the uh, late October 2020, uh, all the uh, pressures we feel. All right, so we have 14 questions so far in our q and I'll give, we'll get through as many as we can. I apologize to those of you who have been patiently waiting in case we can't, but I'm going to just read them out. Any which of you who might want to jump on an answer to them, please just go ahead and volunteer an answer. All right, uh, uh, here's a question. Yet yeah, for the entire 19th century, the only colonialism that affected the Eastern Arab world was the Ottoman Empire. The British and French did not arrive on that scene until World War I, relatively late. North Africa's experience was different um, with French imperialism curling and, and Spanish earlier. So how does this difference between Eastern and Western Arabs historical experience uh, affect the reaction to the Holocaust, Zionism, and the Jewish world. Anybody want to take a bite out of that question? I mean, that's a, um, again, well, thinking about regional specificities. I mean, yeah, Robert. I mean, ju just historically, the, uh, 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 the European actors in the Holocaust uh, principally focused, I mean, it, it occurred in North Africa. There was a, there was a certain moment in, uh, in Syria and Lebanon, very brief um, Vichy control there, you had uh, the, the issue in Iraq um, uh, uh, with uh, the um, sort of German friendly government, although it's important to note that the, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the terrible events that people remember in Iraq actually occurred in the, actually occurred after the demise of the pro-Nazi um, government and technically under British control in Baghdad, um, uh, uh, a, a fact which is often conveniently forgotten by um, uh, uh, by you know, people who like to talk about this issue. Nice point. But, yeah. but the, I mean, the, the main body of sort of Holocaust experience yeah. in the Middle East, in Arab countries, was principally uh, between Morocco and Libya, uh, yeah. between 40 and 43. Good, good point. And other comments there? Let's go into the next one. I heard the speakers talk about the premises of their work. Can they tell us what they found, including examples? Oh boy, this is an open-ended one, but uh, maybe think of one salient interview or, or incident that uh, you'd like to highlight from your work to illustrate it? Uh, I'll, I'll, I think this is a story I tell in my book in the chapter on the youth. Uh, and it's really related to research and, um, and affiliation. So I have this story uh, where I talk about my uh, relationship with the and doing research at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. And so one of the members of the youth actually talks about how Jewish power and, and Jewish control. And, I, and I, I go into this really long conversation where I, I do analyze the story. And then when the book was translated, I sent the, I sent the copy to, 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 uh, to my informant. And we had a, uh, I visited the village at some point and we had a conversation. And we, he was, he, after he read the book, not only he changed in, in many ways, but also he was really happy that I told the story. 
he, he said that in terms of age, talking about really respect of the voices of the, he said, that it, it's, I, I want the story to be out there for people to read that there is this story and it's coming from a background where I want to, as a Muslim, as somebody who's interested in, 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 in the rights of Palestinian, just like interested in the rights of Jews. So, it, so, so that, I think that was an, for me, that was an, the, the, that was an eye-opening story because it's, it highlighted not only what the individual thought at the time in 2004, but also what a kind of conversations we could have over time post the publication and the translation of the book. Um, any other examples that you'd like to highlight or shall we move on to the next question? Yes, no, I see no, yeah, no. Robert. I mean, the, w many examples of Arabs who saved Jews, but I think the, um, uh, the one that uh, uh, struck me the most, um, uh, I, I interviewed somebody for, for a film in, um, in Paris. Uh, he hated Arabs. Elderly Jewish man living in a one-room apartment. He hated Arabs, and he spewed the worst venom. And we were talked for hours about his hatred of, you know, the, the, this, was, this was in the time when Arabs in, in, in Paris were... There was enormous hatred. And then finally, finally, hours into our conversation, he says, there was this one guy who saved me during, during the Nazi occupation when the SS was trying to round us up. And I hid in his, um, in his hammam for several weeks in the basement of his hammam while the Nazis were going door to door. He was a brave man. And then I went to Tunisia and found that guy's son and found the hammam where this older guy was saved. And the story fit perfectly. And it just showed you that you could, you know, even in your own mind, you could transform this history because of your later experience. Yeah. Um, uh, and trying to peel it away and reclaim that is a challenge, but it, 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 it's, it's out there to be repealed and reclaimed. It's apt that you mention France and, uh, you know, there's the controversy now about uh, uh, the president's response that uh, all of Islam has to change because of one person who committed an atrocity against a school teacher, right? Well, there was um, three, there was another one this morning, three uh, people were killed in a church. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, the tendency to expand out to the larger category, as opposed to look at a particular movement or particular individuals, um, you know, is common on both sides or all sides. Uh, there's not even just two. And this relates to the next question in our list. Has there been any impact on public perceptions of Jews, Israelis, and the Holocaust um, in North Africa in the wake of the new Israeli relationships with the UAE and Bahrain? It might be a question for Robert. <laughs> uh, look, the, for the last couple of years, countries around the Middle East, especially in the Gulf, but not solely in the Gulf, have had remarkable outreach on, to Jews. Put aside Israel. Have had amazing, unprecedented outreach on issues relating to Jews and Judaism. Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain. But you have this in North Africa as well. And of course, Morocco has always had a special connection with Jews, Judaism, the Jewish community, but you can you can even see glimmers of this in countries that have not had um, these sort of historic connections. I think there is a general normalizing of Judaism that is happening in many parts of the region. Um, Israel will be will be the the tail end of this, um, uh, but it, it it begins with normalizing Judaism, and that is definitely underway. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to combine two questions here, and they are directed to Professor Boom. Um, how can we speak of pride, uh, you know, um, without paying attention to the reasons why so many Jews left Morocco? And more specifically, um, the question is, were Jews in Morocco actually threatened um, when Israel was created, or was it Mossad and others who persuaded them to leave? I think that's a, that's a really a complex question to answer in a, a few minutes. But but the, the, there are a lot of there are a lot of reasons why Jews left. I think some of them were economic, some of them were part of the 
traditional uh, Zionism, the idea of return, it was there among a lot of um, many members of the Jewish community. But there is also, there is also an antagonism that I think <clears throat> I, I write about this in a piece in a journal, in an, in an article, um, where I, uh, from little Jerus what I call them, from little Jerusalem to the, to the Holy Land. And, and the idea is that I think post-independence nationalists did not, um, some of them actually made a lot of mistakes in terms of reaching out to Jews. So I, I, can, I can definitely, there's a lot of things that have been written about this Taklal party and its, its failure to really reach out to Jews. That's not, I don't think that's the reason, but that's part of the reason. Then you have also the rise of Nasser. Nasser's visit in, the, in 1960 to Morocco was really, created a lot of the issues as far as, and then you have 67 war. So, so it depends, I think you can start from 1948, 49 to 1967, you have different reasons at different moments, but it's a combination of a lot of factors, including economic factors, including the idea that they were promised by Zionist nationalism in Israel, that there is a, it's a better world for you than in Morocco. So all of these reasons are factors. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question. Uh, arguably, Europe is where divergent memory cultures overlap most painfully today, much more than in MENA countries where there is little contact between Arab, Muslims, and Jews outside of the Israel-Palestine context. Please comment on the specific post-Holocaust and post-colonial traumas that clash in European societies and how these could be reconciled. goes back a little but, bit to current events in but, France, but yeah. No, but, but I, 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 is the question also about the descendant or migrant from the Arab world living in, in Europe or? Uh, this is not, yes, go ahead, Mena. Yeah, go ahead, Mena. Go yeah. ahead, Mena. Okay, so I mean, this is a, actually, I, I think it's a very interesting question because um, talking about Europe, uh, especially France and Germany, uh, one sees this conflict of post-Holocaust memory, right? And also the, the rise of anti-Semitism. And then you see the post-colonial memory of the migrant, Muslim Arab migrant, and the rise of Islamophobia. Actually, it's a very, very uh, important thing to think about when you think about European history and memory, because Europeans have two things at hand, right? So the question, I mean, one of the things that I think we are lacking in our educational uh, curriculum, <laughs> especially in the United States, is European history in terms of the 50s and 60s and what happened there, and the migration of uh, Arabs and Africans and Muslims that went to work there um, as temporary workers, right? And then they kind of stayed and had families. So if you go to, say, a place like Berlin, and I was there when um, they took in one million Syrian refugees. And there was a huge pushback, like, oh my God, what are we doing? We can't deal with these people, of course, because they're Muslim and they're Arabs. But what, what, if, you, if you went and talked to them, which I did, where they were staying, they were all professionals, PhD, doctors, teachers, I mean, amazing. Uh, they, they were like the most professional people. And they approached the local people in Berlin because they were stationed in this big government building uh, because they felt embarrassed that there were porta toilets in front of the building because there weren't enough bathrooms. And they went to the local people in Berlin and said, uh, I'm sorry that this porta toilet is in front of your residence or your area, but we would like to extend our services to you. Do you want us to clean your house? Do you need any Medicare? Do you need anything at all? We have all these professionals. It's just a little story about what happens with our perception of the other and how that can change when we give it a chance. So this post-colonial memory, this fear uh, uh, that you're an immigrant living in a, in a country that colonized you, your culture, your language, took your resources. Um, and then this post-Holocaust fear that you're in a country that murdered you, persecuted you, picked you, from every single country that they could is a real, real important aspect of what's going on today because we talk about the height of anti-Semitism and the height of Islamophobia neck to neck in places like Germany and France. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid this brings us to uh, 12.36. We've gone a little bit over time already. I wanna thank all three of our speakers.
uh, Professor Afridi, Professor Boom, and Professor uh, Sethloff, and thank all of our audience. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single question, uh, but I hope, uh, and I think you will join me in uh, hoping that this is the beginning of many conversations on the AU campus and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Ryan. Thank you, Lee. Take care. Thank you, everyone.